since I've been in Columbia living in Columbia for almost 13 years. And um, uh, interviewed a lot of people uh, over the years um, who have been through uh, a lot of trauma and, uh, and very dramatic situations. And always felt that journalism didn't, um, didn't quite make it back in terms of giving me the, the outlet to tell these amazing stories that people were telling me. And, um, and all of these stories, this format, um, your voice of witness, um, is a perfect way to do this. It's a perfect way to, to allow people to tell their stories. Voice of witness, for those of you who may not know, is a series, um, it's imprint of a Swedish publishing company uh, based in San Francisco. Um, it's a series of oral history books that collect a narrative, narrative, narrative sorry, of um, people who have lived through humanitarian and human rights crises around the world. Um, there are books in the series on Sudan, on Zimbabwe, on Burma, on survivors of Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, on uh, women in prison in the United States, on undocumented workers in the United States. So um, ours is the ninth of the series. Columbia. Um, we felt uh, with Max that no series about the humanitarian crisis could be complete without something like Columbia. It's uh, the largest humanitarian crisis in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and very, uh, it doesn't get a lot of press. Yeah, it's, it's not very well known in the United States. Um, but, uh, and through this book, what we wanted to uh, do is challenge a little bit uh, the notion that Colombia's uh, human rights crisis is over. Uh, over the past 10 years, that's been the overriding narrative um, in the United States that uh, this conflict has been raging for about 50 years, um, was winding down and coming to an end. And through the voices of these witnesses, that are in the book, um, we sought to challenge that notion and um, and giving them voice. And I, I would just like to read um, a very short part from the foreword of the book, which was written by Ingrid Bentonford. She's a Colombian politician, and you may have heard of her. She uh, spent six years, a little over six years, as a hostage of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the main leftist guerrilla group in the country. And she was held with uh, quite a few other politicians and, and, uh, and other people in jungle camps for six and a half years. We asked her to uh, write the, the foreword because she uh, very eloquently wrote about her own personal experience in a book uh, called Even Silence Has an End. Um, and her foreword that she wrote for us is called Silence of Shame. Here. Remembering is painful, and telling your story involves submerging yourself deeply and intensely in your own past, bringing forth a flood of uncontrolled emotion. You become conscious of your most glaring vulnerabilities, but sharing is also your way out. Every time you tell your story, you can distance yourself from it and take a step back. You learn to remember without reliving and begin to recover. Now, um, we don't mean to say, um, and we don't believe that everyone um, whose story we include in this book um, has gone through this process of, of, of recovering. There are different people in different stages of dealing with their pain and their, their experiences. Um, but in as much as we could, we uh, wanted to participate in, in this process um, of, of helping people relive or retell without reliving. Um, and Columbia's conflict and history is very complicated. It's, um, it's messy. And Max is, uh, will talk a little bit about the current state of the conflict. And I agree from one of the narratives. So, 
Colombia is often understood as uh, just a drug war where there's senseless violence by drug cartels in the country with bombings all over the place. And that, that, that really is the source of violence in the country. But, but uh, the human rights problems in Colombia, the nature of the violence is actually much more complex. The country has been uh, experienced internal armed conflict for the past 50 years. Uh, the main actors in the conflict are left-wing guerrillas, uh, founded in the 1960s, uh, uh, founded with Marxist ideology, intent to overthrow the state. The two main groups are the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC guerrillas, and the National Liberation Army of Colombia, the ELN guerrillas. Uh, both of those guerrilla groups exist today. The FARC has about 8,000. 10,000 members, the ELN has about 1,500 members. Uh, their signature crimes, um, kidnapping, and kidnapping, uh, forcibly recruiting children, laying, uh, planting uh, anti-personnel landmines. About 10,000 Colombians have been victims of, of fall victims to landmines. I think about 4,000 of those victims are civilians. Uh, they've also committed killings, massacres. That's one group. Uh, those are those. That's one side of the conflict. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, right-wing paramilitary groups cropped up throughout the country. Uh, these groups, uh, largely militias, they represented the confluence of interests of, of landowners who had become targeted of, of guerrilla extortion and kidnapping, uh, as well as drug traffickers who wanted to uh, defend their power against guerrilla groups and also wanted to avoid the extortion and kidnapping, as well as the Colombian military, uh, which had a counterinsurgency objective. So there's a powerful mix of interests that gave rise to these paramilitary groups, which expanded rapidly throughout the country and accumulated incredible power uh, with allies in, in the Colombian Congress and even in the national government. Uh, those groups officially participated in the mobilization process between 2003 and 2006, which had severe uh, shortcomings and flaws, and, and new groups uh, emerged after that process. Um, paramilitary successor groups or emerging criminal gangs, the government calls them, they also commit widespread abuse against civilians. And then the Colombian military is also obviously involved in the conflict. Uh, they were, have been involved in, in extrajudicial executions against civilians, particularly between, uh, there was a peak in crime between 2004 and 2008 where uh, the military would recruit uh, generally four young men, um, execute them, and dress them up as guerrillas, and present them as combat kills. Those crimes, have, uh, the reported crimes, have reduced, uh, declined drastically in the past few years. But that, those are the types of abuses that the military has committed against civilians. All of these abuses have caused forced displacement. Um, according to government numbers, about four million Colombians have been driven from their homes since 1997. Uh, we're giving Colombia one of the highest uh, population of internally displaced people uh, in the world, which is what this book is about, uh, forced displacement. Of displaced people have been displaced from their homes. So I'm going to read uh, a passage uh, from Danny Cuervo. Uh, Danny, when he was 18, his girlfriend became pregnant, and he was jobless at the time. And he moved to a part of southern Colombia uh, to seek work at a, at a slaughterhouse. And his job wasn't making any money. And this is around 2004. A, a paramilitary group offered him work and uh, made a mistake. And he went with them. Uh, and and they, they took him to a training camp. So I'll read from his start where, where Danny's being driven to the training camp. It felt like we were driving for about an hour and 45 minutes on a dirt road. It was about seven at night when the car stopped and they took the blindfold off. I didn't know where we were. All I knew was that it was a jungle. The pilots took me to a camp in the middle of the jungle. There were around 150 men there and some women too. They were in uniform. Some were all in green, others in camouflage. They wore boots. Some had green hats. Some had their chips tied around their necks. They were between 15 and 40 years old. The older ones were the commanders. 
Some of them were cooking in a tent, and smoke was pouring out of it. I was told to get in line for food, but I wasn't hungry. One of the paramilitary said, eat, because you'll be hungry later. So I got in line, and I met a boy there. He was friendly and young, even younger than I was at the time. I asked him, I asked him if they were going to kill me. He said that they wouldn't kill me, that I had simply been recruited, and that, I'd been there for some, and that I'd be there for some time when they taught me things like how to shoot and other survival stuff. The boy told me he hadn't seen his family since he'd been recruited. He said, my family are the people here. I can't call, I can't communicate with anyone else. That made me even more scared. I was handed a cup to receive the food. It was rice soup. I ate it, and then I was told to go to sleep early because they would wake me up very early the next day. I wanted to sleep near the boy who had talked to me in line, so I lay down next to him on the ground underneath a plastic tarp. The boy lent me a blanket. I didn't think I would be able to go to sleep, and soon I started to cry. The boy told me not to cry. I told him I didn't want to be there, and he said, there's nothing to be done now. He told me that the next day the commanders would explain everything, that once you're in, the only way you can leave is if you're dead. I cried even harder then, and the other men who were around us told us to shut up, to stop fucking around, that I was acting like a little girl. Someone said, we'll teach you how to be a man here. I quietly said to the boy, please help me, I don't want to be here. And he said, I can't do anything. I'm just like you here. I explained to him that I came from a poor, a poor family, that I had come to the Eastern Plains to work for my soon-to-be-born child. He said that even so, he couldn't do anything. Somehow I fell asleep. It felt like I'd only slept for about five minutes when the boy woke me up. Everything was silent and dark. He whispered me to, to get up and not to make any noise. He told me I shouldn't put my shoes on, but to carry them in my hand. Then he led me to a corner of the camp that was unguarded. Once we were outside the camp, he said, you know what, brother? I'm helping you because I understand. That's how I wound up here too. Then he said, well, let's walk. And we walked in silence for about 45 minutes over sharp rocks, but I didn't mind the pain. We reached a point and he told me to run. He said, start running in that direction until you find a road. I can't help you anymore because I have to get back. He told me that if I got caught, I couldn't say he'd help me. I thanked him and put on my shoes and started running. He never told me his name. I ran, ran, ran. I was really scared. The shadows of the trees looked like people, as if they were watching me. The boy told me I'd find the road soon, but I couldn't find it, and I said to myself, I must be getting lost, but I didn't stop running. I ran and I cried. I slipped and I tripped. And sometimes I felt I couldn't keep going. I stood for a while to rest, to wipe away my tears and blow my nose on my t-shirt. It was warm. I could hear the sound of the birds and the cicadas. I tried not to blink or close my eyes because I thought, if I close my eyes, I may get lost. I was very anxious, a little lighter. I could hear a car every once in a while, so I knew I was close to the road. I kept running until I found it. I started walking around along the road but I didn't know which direction, direction to go because I was totally disoriented. I started walking to my right for about 15 minutes. Then I jogged, stopped, jogged, stopped. It scared me that the paramilitaries might pass by me on their pickups or motorcycles, but not a single car went by. Then I saw a bus coming. I waved it down and got in, but the driver didn't want to take me because I was really dirty. I was soaking with sweat. My shoes were muddy and my t-shirt was full of snot, and I only had something like $1.50, all in coins. I said, please, please take me even, it's only one kilometer. The driver said, get off. I had to stand in the aisle of the bus and ask the driver and the passengers to help me because I'd been robbed. <coughs> I didn't say anything about what had really happened, and the passengers began to tell the driver, what's the matter, take him, don't be selfish, help him. Most Colombians are like that. So Danny uh, is able to escape the camp and make it to a nearby city of Vicencio, where his mother is living. He goes there and uh, tries to get some money so he can, so he can leave the area. And, and when he's there, paramilitaries show up at his house and threaten his mother 
and his young sister at gunpoint, telling, asking them where he is. So he realizes he has to flee, and he ends up going to Ecuador, um, where he he moves, and he, eventually his soon to be born child is born, and, and the child starts to live with him in Ecuador, and he, he has another kid who's sent to live with him in Ecuador. So right now, Danny is living in Ecuador as a refugee. Um, and struggling to provide for his family, he sells handicrafts on buses. So, read the passage about his life in Ecuador. There's a movie called The Pursuit of Happiness, starring Will Smith. After I saw it, I thought, that's how I have to be. It's about a dad who couldn't get ahead. He has debts and so many problems that his wife leaves him with their little one. And he begins, and he begins to walk with his little boy. He gets evicted. He has no job. He has to go hungry in order to give food to his little one. They have to sleep in homeless shelters. That movie really got to me. I feel like it's my movie. At the end of the film, he becomes a billionaire, and he employs many people who struggle like he did. That's something I would like, to someday be well off so I can give a hand to many people in need. My children really love me. They've struggled with me. We've been through the good and the bad. When I have a little bit of money, I buy them Saji Papita. Sometimes I say, I want you to make the burgers the way you make them. And so I run out fast, I buy ground beef, I get spices, and I make their burgers. If they only knew what I feel, if they knew how much I asked God to help us, I always turn to the baby Jesus. On Sundays I go to church and say, baby Jesus, I'm here with my little ones. Every time I go, I leave something of mine there so God will remember me. I used to leave little photos I had of me, but then I ran out. So once I left an expired refugee claiming card, sometimes I leave a letter. I met a girl here that I like a lot. She's my landlord's daughter, the one who always helps out with my kids. I like her because of the way she acts with my kids, but I haven't told her anything because I feel that maybe she doesn't have time for me, because maybe I don't have anything to offer her. I don't have money and I don't have anywhere to invite her to theirs. But the truth is, I have a heart and I fall in love and I get excited. I think that someday, I'll tell her that I like her. Um, so, Danny, uh, as I said, is still living in Ecuador, struggling to provide for his family. He's been through some incredibly traumatic experiences, escaping the paramilitary camp. He knows the consequences of if they were to find him. The paramilitaries obviously commit killings, massacres. And, but, but I think something that also shines through in the narrative is. Um, <coughs> parts is very Danny's resilience um, to provide for his family. There's also acts of kindness uh, that, that, that shine through the Colombians on the, uh, the Colombians on the bus who actually do intervene to try to get the, get the bus driver to, to help him escape, which could cost you your life actually in Colombia if the paramilitaries were to find out that somebody had abetted him escaping. So I think that also comes through a lot of the narratives, although they're in the face of tremendous loss and, and, and violence, a lot of these people are able to, to persevere in these situations and, and continue to find meaning and love for their family. I would just add that Danny is one of about 500,000 refugees, aside from the 4 million displaced Colombians, internally displaced. There are about 500,000 uh, refugees, Colombian refugees in neighboring countries of Venezuela, Ecuador, Panama. Most of them are in Ecuador. Uh, but the vast majority don't actually have refugee status. Uh, Danny does. He was able to get it for him and his children. Um, only about 50, uh, yeah, 50,000 uh, Colombians in Ecuador have refugee status. So to give it a little context. And going to what um, Max was saying about the resilience. We chose to talk to victims of Colombia's violence and um, through the um, through the prism of, of displacement because displacement is sort of a secondary uh, victimization. People flee their homes because something happened or something's about to happen or there are threats against them um, or they've witnessed some, some sort of atrocity or been victims directly of, of some sort of atrocity. So, um, um, but we, in no way, uh, is our purpose to, to collect, you know, in collecting these stories is to um, have people be 
feel sorry for uh, these people. They don't. They are incredibly strong, incredibly resilient, um, very, very brave. In no small part, I mean, just the, the fact of telling their stories to us, uh, sharing them um, in, in this level of detail. Um, and uh, many of the, of the narrators ask for anonymity because of their own security. Uh, so we, we've changed their names, uh, we've used their pseudonyms and changed names of some of the locations and some details to protect them. But others, ask us to use their real names and ask us to, um, to very specifically tell their story and, and, and let them tell their story. Um, and that's the case of a woman named Julia Povitz. She um, <coughs> lives on the northern coast of Colombia in um, some low-lying mountains called the Montes de Maria that have been the scene of some of Colombia's worst massacres and, and some of the most vicious violence. Um, she and her husband were part of a cooperative, uh, a farm cooperative on a farm called La Alemania, which means the Germany. But, um, and, and so there were 27 fam families collectively farming this land. Um, paramilitary troops came in, took over the farm, they resisted and stayed for a few months um, uh, and finally fled to a nearby city. Um, when the paramilitary is immobilized, as, as Max described, they went back to their farm and tried to recover um, what they had lost in terms of the crops and cattle that they had in their homes. Um, and they returned to find that, uh, in fact, the farm had been foreclosed. They, they had collectively bought this farm government subsidies, but it was foreclosed, and they were about to lose the farm entirely. Um, and her husband, Rogelio, uh, started fighting against this in the courts, um, spoke out in the media, um, which sounds really easy, but it probably is an act of incredible bravery, um, because there are very powerful forces who wanted uh, to take this farm uh, still. Um, Rogelio was, received uh, dozens of death threats uh, and denounced every one of them. Um, and he was killed in May of 2011, I'm sorry, 2010. Um, he was gunned down on his way back to the farm from the closest village. Uh, and. Um, <coughs> Julia, who's the person that we talked to, um, speaks a little bit about what happens next, what happens after after this killing in her life. So I'll just read a little bit about her uh, from her narrative. I didn't leave the farm when they killed Rohidu. The people from the government's human rights office told me I should. I don't think I'll ever leave, even though we don't know what his killers have in mind for the rest of us. When Rogelio took the job as president of the cooperative, I didn't like the idea because I knew that it carried risks. But today, I'm the new president, since March 2011. I'm doing it out of the love I had for Rogelio and the love that he had for La Alemania. I don't care about the risk. I'm doing it for him so that his dream is accomplished, to see La Alemania free of debt so that people can say La Alemania is ours. That's what Rogelio would have wanted. Um, so I think it, these words from Julio express the resistance that people are, are, uh, are posing to these violent forces that would have them um, leave their homes again. And, uh, uh, and the power that that all of these narrators um, have to tell their stories, their bravery, and, um, and you know, we're incredibly grateful to every one of them for sharing their stories um, and letting us share them with you. So with that, um, we're happy to take questions. Thank you so much.